everyone. My name is Laura Mullen, and on behalf of ACRL and CHOICE, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Strategies for Finding Reliable International Statistics and Publications, sponsored by World Bank Publications and featuring a panel comprised of Amanda Walkerup of the University of Alberta and Shauna Wagger and Devika Levy of World Bank Publications. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and CHOICE that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the left-hand side, you will also see a Q&A panel that you can use to submit questions or comments. We will spend some time responding to your questions during the program, so please do feel free to submit these throughout. And finally, please note that today's program will be recorded and all registrants will receive follow-up instructions on how to access the archived version. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel for today. Shauna Wagger manages technology and electronic product development for the World Bank Publishers Office, including the World Bank eLibrary. She has over 20 years experience in publishing. Before joining the World Bank, Shauna developed electronic products in scholarly reference at CQ Press and Alexander Street Press. Amanda Walkeruk is the Government Information Librarian at the University of Alberta. She has worked with official government statistics in public, special, and academic libraries since 1999, including a year as a data librarian at a large academic library. She manages a half-day session on international statistics at the annual three-day Winter Institute in Statistical Literacy for Librarians, and is the current coordinator of the International Documents Task Force of the American Library Association's Government Documents Roundtable. Devika Levy is the Sales and Outreach Manager for World Bank Publications. She has more than 20 years of experience in marketing and sales of educational media. Prior to coming to the World Bank, she worked at National Geographic for 12 years in the school publishing, educational video, and digital media divisions. And now I'd like to get us started by turning things over to Devika Levy. Devika? Thanks, Laura. So I'd like to start with a little bit of background about the World Bank. Um, we are not a bank in the traditional sense. Um, we are an international government organization and we are the world's largest nonprofit source of development assistance. We are comprised of 188 member countries, and we offer low or no interest loans or credits and grants to low income countries. We're also known as a knowledge bank. Uh, we conduct and publish research on a broad range of social and economic development issues, and that's in order to find development solutions. We have two ambitious goals, and those are to end extreme poverty within a generation and to boost shared, pro shared prosperity. Today's presenters will be showing you search strategies using the World Bank eLibrary and the World Bank Open Data Portal. If you're not familiar with the World Bank eLibrary, it's the World Bank's online collection of all World Bank books, journals, and working papers since the 1990s. And it's a great resource for publications on a variety of global and re regional issues. It's available to institutions by subscription, and it offers many time-saving tools, such as individual user accounts and access to our latest books at the chapter level. For librarians, it offers many benefits, such as mark records, counter for reports, and our content is indexed in major search and discovery systems. So why should you use the World Bank eLibrary? Well, it's authoritative content written by the world's top economists and experts in development, it's used by the world's uh, top academic institutions, government and UN agencies, central banks, and NGOs around the world. It covers a broad range of issues and topics. The content is curated and focused on research and publications. 
It is specifically designed for the needs of researchers and librarians, and the content is easy to find and use. This is just a sampling of the topics that we cover. And most people are surprised to learn that we conduct research beyond finance and economics. As you can see, we have a very broad range, and we cover everything from food security, emerging markets, corruption, and many other topics that are not listed here. You may be familiar with our open data portal at data.worldbank.org. And our data team has made some improvements to the site recently, including a redesign of the home page, improvements to the data catalog, the country and topic pages, which now contain more data, video tutorials, and as always, there are visualization tools. There are more languages now, and there are up to 17 local languages for 24 countries. And there's a new knowledge-based site, which answers many frequently asked questions that you or your users may have. And this is in addition to the data help desk, which is always available to answer your specific questions about World Bank data. And now I'll be turning it over to Amanda, who will show you how to use this free resource to find international statistics. Amanda? Hi there. Thank you, Devika. Um, we've got about 20 minutes or so to walk through some of the statistical information that is freely available through the data portal section of the World Bank website. This section of the webinar will focus on the portions of the website and more importantly, I think, the intellectual entry points that I've found to be most useful when working with faculty and students in an academic library. But there are many different ways to get to the information that we're going to cover here today. Now, over the years, I've observed a lot of librarian angst <laughs> and stress when working with questions around international statistics. And I think one of the main reasons for this seems to be a deep and, quite frankly, valid insecurity around issues of authority, especially when it comes to comparability. Um, and there, I think there are good reasons for that. There are a lot of cases of policymakers and journalists and students who made mistakes about choosing statistical information and attempted to compare statistics across countries that were not, in fact, comparable at all. Or they used statistics from unreliable sources that just didn't add up and then they couldn't defend those statistics. And uh, it's not really our scope to go into those examples, but I, I would like to sort of reinforce and underscore that that's where using statistics made available through the World Bank and its partners can help alleviate some of that concern and stress. And that's because the work of statistical oversight is, for the most part, taken care of for you as a librarian. And I won't spend much time on this, but I just wanted to point out that the United Nations Statistical Commission, which calls itself the apex entity of the global statistical system, has been tasked with assisting the UN's Economic and Social Council with coordinating the statistical work of the specialized agencies, of which, of course, the World Bank is one. So if you're curious, or if you need to underscore that authority um, with the user, there, you should know that there is documentation on the Statistical Commission's website about how the development data group at the World Bank meets goals around producing statistics of high quality. So the takeaway here is that, for me, as an introduction, is just that the statistics on the World Bank site are high quality and you have the tools at your disposal to back them up if needed. And I think that resonates with a lot of our users in academia. So let's take a look at the site itself. Uh, this is worldbank.org and you can see there's a lot going on here. They've really tried to appeal to a wide range of users and your optimal access point naturally is going to depend on what your user needs. Um, maybe they uh, want to focus on a specific country and actually once we get into the data site here, my apologies, you can see that uh, you can go in directly to country if your users are focusing on a single country and they're listed here for you. Uh, I just want to point out that we've also got uh, sections on the right, developing regions, income levels, other country groups that might be particularly useful for students and faculty in poli-sci or economics. Um, however, you may be using or working with users that know they need specific topics or know they need statistics on a specific topic. And that's where you could maybe be better served by drilling down into the topic tab at the top. And that's what we're seeing here. And as, uh, as Devika had said, there are a wide range of topics covered by World Bank programs and researchers. And you're, 
it's worth just taking a moment to note that it's everything here from health and poverty to gender, environment. There's a lot going on here. Chances are, though, I'm willing to bet most of the people in your organizations would be able to find this stuff on their own. Um, it's probably going to be the people who are looking at specific indicators that you're working with, and this next tab might be a place to take them. You can work through searching indicators uh, with them on this site if they know some of the language already. That's something that the World Bank has set up through this interface. Um, to be completely honest, however, uh, most of the work that I end up doing, especially with professors and librarians, is through the data catalog. And you can link to that here. I think um, it just seems to resonate with professors and librarians that the catalog is an, a system of organization that, that's just a little bit more intuitive for them. Uh, and I do want to point out that on the left, you have the opportunity to refine by certain topics. And this isn't the default organization on the website. I've actually uh, broken that out for you. I've increased that hierarchy for you. And um, yeah, so you could, for example, click on gender and see the 12 databases on this side that would be relevant to gender. I haven't done that on this slide. I've just let all of the databases um, show as, as you can see them here. And, and just a quick note, there are things like uh, databases dedicated to the African Development Indicators or the World Bank, or sorry, the World Development Indicators at the top. And to be honest, that is more times than not my go-to entry point. So if there was a takeaway here for you, um, I would stress that data catalog as an entry point and then world development indicators. And let me show you why. Uh, it is um, preceded by a print publication, and I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the WDI, as we call it. It dates the print version dated back to 1978, although I should point out that between 78 and 96, it was issued as a statistical annex in the World Development Report. And I don't know how long many of the people on the call have been in librarianship, but I can remember in the late 90s using the WDI and the reference desk at, um, at my public library when I worked there, as well as uh, government libraries. And it was, I, I picked it up for a lot of reasons. One was that it had statistics that no one else had. But also, it was very easy to flip to the back and look at the data tables and the data documentation. So you could explain to the users what they were looking at, and they could uh, interpret it with a, a greater level of confidence than we could do with some other products. And that's becoming increasingly important as we turn to uh, the, the wide open web for statistics. And I'm happy to say that this online interface to the WDI, which uh, you can get to through the data banks link on the top right, includes that metadata. They have kept it and expanded upon it in many ways. And, and that's something that I, I just wanted to highlight. But Let's get into the data bank itself. So I've just opened it up, and I, I think, um, unless you have the full screen, it might be difficult to see this in detail. I apologize for that. Um, so for those of you who, who can and are willing to do the full screen, you might want to do that. Um, let's take a look at the interface itself. This is uh, organized in the anticipation that you're going to select a country, and then you're going to select a series, and then you're going to select your time. And that's the main organization. The default is to encourage you to select your country first, and you have 214 options there. Um, now, as you can see, you've just got a list of all the countries here. However, there are other options for narrowing, including the establishment of aggregates, which we're going to look at in a second. Um, there are hierarchies, and I just hope that expansion there helps a bit. So we can look at groupings of countries that are a certain income level or a certain lending category or a certain region. And if I select one of those, like the low income category, the countries that are listed will decrease and I will only be seeing the countries that are part of that category. I think that's fairly uh, intuitive. I just wanted to point it out. Okay. The aggregates can also be very useful. Uh, again, especially for poli-sci and economic students, I would hesitate to 
to guess. Uh, you can see there are some that are probably fairly intuitive, like European Union will include the countries of the European Union, uh, likewise with OECD, et cetera. But sometimes you'll see a category that you may not uh, know of immediately. Uh, for example, you may have students that say, well, this aggregate says Arab world. What does that mean? Who's included in that Arab world? And that's where this metadata tab becomes so important. I believe this is supposed to be an eyeball. I think that's what it's, it's supposed to be. And maybe one of my colleagues at the World Bank will correct me if I'm wrong. But if you click on that eyeball looking item there, that icon, you're going to get some metadata. You're going to learn how the World Bank is defining that aggregate in this example. And here we can see that the Arab world aggregate is composed of members of the League of Arab States. So that offers some clarification about what you're looking at. Um, so that's a value added, I think. All right, so you pick your country as your first order of getting into the database. And what I've done is just selected all the countries that are available, so all 214. And then I'm going to move forward and select that is most relevant to my student. And this is where your, your reference interview will have assisted you, of course. Um, you note that you can just search a key and type a keyword to try to find a series on your own. There are 1,300 series in here. And we all know the perils of controlled vocabulary. Um, so unless you have someone who's done some background research and knows the language, or it's a fairly common indicator, this, uh, this may or may not be the place to go. I, for new users, I often point out the topic hierarchy options at the far left of the screen. And for example, I've just opened up poverty here and looked at the different options we have. We have income distribution, poverty rates. Um, we have things like poverty gap at $2 a day, PPP as a percentage. Um, you might be asking, what the heck does that mean? And that's, again, I'd like to point out that metadata tab is very useful. It explains in, in detail what they mean. There's a long definition here. So it's showing that the poverty gap is the mean shortfall from the poverty line expressed as a percentage of the poverty line. So the, what the series we'll be looking at is a percentage um, whereby the higher the percentage, the greater the depth of poverty. Now you're going to have users that want to take it much further, and that's where they can read the details and get what they need that way. One other thing about the metadata that I'd like to point out is that you always have a place, a source information box here. And that's really important because if you want to uh, use this in a research paper or you want to find out more on the topic, this source will give you the information you need to do that uh, further research. And in this case, you can see that the World Bank is drawing that data from household surveys uh, by working with government statistical agencies. So just an FYI for those users who need to back up what they're looking at in reports. OK, so I have selected, as you can see, the poverty gap at $2 a day. And then I'm going forward. And the next thing that I'm prompted to do is select my time. I'd like to point out that the World Bank um, WDI has data back to 1960. And in the history of international statistics, comparable international statistics, that's pretty darn good. Um, we don't see a lot of internationally comparable statistics until the interwar period and could talk for an hour about that history, but that's not what the webinar is about. So suffice it to say, I'm just going to select all years that are available to me, 1960 to 2013, and move forward and produce a table by clicking on that table button at the top right. Um, one of the things that I have students asking about when we first open a table like this is why are there so many blanks? And uh, that's something that, again, that metadata can help you explore with them. I, I just want to stress that the blanks are not zeros. People who are new to statistical tables sometimes assume that a blank 
cell is an uh, indication that there, are, there is a zero. That's not the case. Um, and uh, and the, the metadata can explain why there are variations or omissions. And a lot of times it has to do with statistical capacity. Um, not all countries have the same amount of support for statistical programs. And agencies like the World Bank and other UN agencies are working to help um, you know, improve statistical capacity, but in many cases it, it's just not, there are a lot of countries that for a variety of reasons aren't producing statistics that are comparable, and statistical capacity is one of those reasons. So that's sometimes why you see empty fields, uh, just an FYI. Okay, now I want to take a moment, if you'll allow me, to take to look at some of the other theories that are available in this database. As I said, there are 1,300 uh, in this database, and it, it uh, is a lot of overlap between the different categories. And I have worked with people who are often surprised at what's in this database. Uh, things like, let's see, cause of death by injury, um, condom use, uh, community health care workers, what else have we got here? We've got uh, under health, I've narrowed it down to reproductive health, and uh, you may or may not be surprised to see, see things like the fertility rate as a series, uh, wanted fertility rate uh, as, a, as a different series, lifetime risk of maternal death, um, what else, let's see, uh, under labor and social protection, a different subcategory, we have economic activity, which includes things like vulnerable employment, uh, part-time employment uh, for broken down by gender. These are historically rather tricky things to tease out. And as you may have guessed, uh, data statistics like these are, are often coming from partner organizations. There are a lot of different agencies that are contributing to this database, working with the World Bank, including uh, agencies like the International Labor Organization or the World Health Organization. And I think it's clear that that, that is uh, what we're seeing here. Um, emissions, United Nations Environment Program is another partner. So you may not think of the World Bank when you think of CO2 emissions, but I just wanted to take the time we have here to illustrate some of the breadth of content in this database. Okay. So let's say we want to search a different way. I took you through the trees, the hierarchies, but you can also drill right down and search the series search box. And in what you're seeing on the screen in front of you is an example of what happens when you search for the word military. Uh, you can see that there are, in fact, four different series that come up. And just for the sake of illustration, let's say we're interested in military expenditure as a percentage of GDP. So I'm going to select that. And I know this is a little hard to see, but I wanted to show you what the entire screen looks like. So if you're working on your own on this, um, you'll, you'll have your series here, and then you'll have your table chart map options here at the far right. The, the interface also remembers what you've done before, so you can see your previous searches. They're still there as series. And once you click on table, it's going to give you an orientation that we saw before. I also want to point out that, that that metadata eyeball is still here. And if we were to open this at this point, I, I'm not going to do it for the, for the webinar, but if you were to open this, you would learn that this series is actually being compiled by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. As I mentioned earlier, the WDI um, is a product out of partnership, and there are a wide range of international and governmental agencies um, contributing to this, uh, private and non-governmental organizations. So everything from UNEP and WHO, like I mentioned earlier, to the International Institute for Strategic Studies and Standard and Poor's, uh, so you're accessing statistics from a wide range, but they've all gone through some sort of oversight. So the quality is, is still there, definitely. And more importantly, you have the metadata to prove that quality if you need to, or to investigate it further if, um, if need be. So the default uh, configuration of what we have on the screen is, let me just pull this up, 
is here, the default orientation is to have the series, which is that S, as the uh, main organizing unit for the page. Then we have countries in the columns, and then we have time, or sorry, countries uh, down the rows, and time in the columns. That's the default, and for this series it works pretty good. But I can tell you a lot of users uh, are working with searches that this default may not work with optimally. And there is an opportunity here at the top. There's a cog that you can click on and reorient things. I just wanted to make you aware of that. That's often what I spend a bit of time with users on in WDI, is making sure the orientation works. So just a hint, if you're seeing something that's a little different than what you were expecting, there is this settings cog and an orientation change, apply changes and go from there. Now, sometimes the table is what you want. The charting function is very strong. We don't really have time to go into it here, but I just wanted to point out it's there. There's also a mapping function, and for this series in particular, uh, mapping is a, is a really neat way to go. You can see what happens here. We have uh, a military expenditure broken out on this world map whereby the darkest colors of red are 2.9% or more as a percentage of GDP, and the lightest shades of yellow are less than 0.9% of GDP spent on military in that year, which happens to be 2012. So this is another permutation of the statistical information we've selected through the series, and it can be really helpful for reports or, um, or whatever your user is, is working on. And I don't have it on the screen, unfortunately, but one nice thing about most of the World Bank products is that you do have a citation that's given to you uh, in the, the interface, so that can be really helpful for your users as well to just take and cite their sources. Um, naturally, you can also download stuff, and the download options are what you'd expect, Excel, CSV, etc. Uh, you also have the option to download different types of metadata, so you can, uh, the default is to download all the metadata, but you can also customize that. So that was a very, very quick and I feel almost breathless <laughs> overview of, uh, of two of the series that you can pull from the 1300 that are available to you in the WDI. And, um, and I, I hope that gives you uh, better awareness, but also the confidence to go back and try some of those searches on your own. Just play with it. Give yourself five minutes to explore what's in there. So you're ready when someone comes to you on the desk or emails you or you have a colleague who wants some help with international statistics. Now, there's also another section of this portal that I, I wanted to spend one or two minutes on, and that's the microdata section. Uh, microdata is a tricky thing to define uh, in a couple of seconds, but I'm going to give it a shot. It basically, microdata in this context is data upon which the statistics were actually created, if you will. So um, a survey is conducted, the answers are tabulated, and statistics are compiled. What we've been looking at so far are the statistical series. Microdata files give you access to the data that was tabulated and compiled before it is organized into statistics or statistical series. And if you go into that microdata tab, you will have access to the library, which you can search through collections or just through the catalog. And, and again, for in the interest of time and brevity, I'm just going to jump to a particular survey here. This is the Public Expenditure Tracking Survey in Education from 2004, conducted in Cambodia. And, um, and I've, I've selected this one because uh, it, has a, it has a lot of great related materials available, which is actually pretty typical in this data catalog, including the questionnaire. So you can look at the student questionnaire and see things like, you know, what was on that questionnaire. The students had to give their name, their student number, answer questions like, are you a boy or a girl? What grade are you in? How old you are? You just go, what language do you speak at home? And depending on the answer, the, the value tied to the response category or the response would go in the box on the right. Uh, pretty intuitive, but just keep it in mind as we move forward. So other questions on this survey included things like what type of lighting do you have at home? Uh, do you have a TV? Do you have a radio? 
Do you have a plow? Do you have, how many cows do you keep at home? How many water buffalo? Um, so in addition to giving the researcher information about what they can find in the data files, we're also learning a little bit about the context of, of the Cambodia experience and, and what the students may have as part of their lives uh, or how they're, yeah, what their living conditions are like. So questions like how many times per week do you eat breakfast um, and so on. So that's the questionnaire. Uh, and the questionnaire is then tabulated and the data dictionary gives you, uh, or sorry, the, the questionnaire is completed, the results are tabulated, and the data dictionary gives you detailed information about the variables within the data files. So this is the documentation that helps you figure out which variable represents answers to specific questions on the survey, or perhaps a derived variable based on one or more questions. So this is the file that tells you what variables you use with specialized software like SPSS or SAS or whatever, so that you can run, run cross tabulations that might answer questions um, like, let's see, how about, uh, for the students that said they, they worked every day after coming home from school, how many of them had a radio at home? Or how many of them, what type of lighting did they have? So you can run these cross tabs uh, using the microdata that you download to answer questions that you may not have been able to explore with statistical theories that were already created. And that's the, the, the power of these microdata files. So it's, it's pretty cool. It, it's a really exciting and interesting area of librarianship, in my opinion, because you're helping researchers create new knowledge in a way. Um, but it also requires a little bit of specialized training, and it be, can be kind of daunting. So I think for the average librarian, just knowing that this section is here uh, on the World Bank website is important. Also, knowing that they have external partners that are contributing their own data theories and data files to this catalog is, is useful as well. And I think this is growing. My sense is that over the few last few years, the data catalog has been growing for sure. All right. Again, a very quick overview here. Um, there is one other section of the data portal that I'd like to highlight, and that's the blog. I'm not sure how often I would take users here in the course of a reference interview, um, but I would say that it's worth you reading and looking at um, because some of the entries can really help you with your own classroom work and your own IL work. Uh, for example, this uh, question about the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments is one that I use with the Statistical Literacy Institute every year. And, um, and I had actually just stumbled on this blog entry in preparing for the webinar here today and was thrilled to see that not only does she discuss, the, the blog writer, not only does she discuss that um, uh, the statistic, but she unpacks the story behind it a little bit. And she gives us more information about um, understanding why Rwanda has such a high, high percentage of seats held by women in national parliaments, and in fact, how that country er, is a little different than what you see in the, the ministerial positions held by women in that country. So she's helping us understand the story behind the statistics, and I think that's really useful when you're working with students uh, and faculty, or, or any researchers, really. Um, Another nice thing about the blog is that it also it can inspire you to do more with the graphing functions. And you can see here some pretty fancy graphs that are easy to use once you know what you want, or sorry, easy to create in the WDI software once you know what you want. But sometimes it's, it's tough to even know what you want. <laughs> so I use the blog um, sort of to get ideas about using these statistical theories in the classroom and, and maybe with more advanced users. Um, and it's just something that I wanted to point out on the site. So that's a lot of information that I've just thrown at you in one breathless monologue. I'm not used to just projecting. I, I like a lot of active learning techniques, so I'm, uh, it's very different. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions you may have at the end of the session. I, I hope that was, that was helpful. And now I'm going to turn it over to Shauna. Hi, um, this is Shauna Wagger. So thank you very much, Amanda, 
for um, a great presentation. And I'm going to um, pick back up and talk about the World Bank eLibrary. And I hope that everyone can hear me, so uh, just chime in on the chat if you can't. Uh, the World Bank eLibrary, um, as Devika noted, has a lot of features and functions. And today, we're going to focus on strategies for finding content. We're happy to answer any questions about any other aspect of the eLibrary, but we'll be focusing on ways to find the content. And before we jump in, I'll just reorient us a little bit that the eLibrary is a subscription website intended for use by students, faculty, and researchers, whether at the undergraduate, graduate, or professional level. And it's usually used within the institutional academic context. So it fits in with that ecosystem with some of the special tools, uh, research tools, and tools for the library ecosystem uh, that Devika mentioned. And the site itself is based on the premium research of the bank. And that includes the entire, the entire formal book program, our journals, and our highest quality working papers. So it's really intended for um, a great um, premium research experience. So now that we've talked about that, I'm going to use this home page to um, orient you to the major ways to find content. And um, as you might be able to see at the top of the browse, uh, at the top of the navigation here, we have um, several browses, including browses by region and country, browse by topic, and browse by collections, which refers to books, journals, working papers. So browses are a great way in, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later. You'll also see here that we have um, uh, an advanced search and a quick search. And these, again, along with the browses, are persistently available across the site. And the browses and the searches, which we'll talk about later, are great ways into the content. We also have some um, things down here as well. And here are um, tabs that take you to the newest content on the site and a tab that um, takes you to the most popular content. And these are great, very straightforward, very focused ways into the content if you're interested in seeing what other people have found useful. The most popular can um, definitely do that for you. And um, if you're interested in what the newest journal articles are, what the newest books are. So these things down here are very straightforward, great ways into the content. Before we go back to talk in each of the, the, um, the searches, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about what we know about the content. And this um, goes along with um, all of um, Amanda's comments about metadata and how important that is. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the bibliographic metadata, the, the title, you know, the, the DOIs, and the numbers that you see here, but to talk a little bit more about the substantive metadata. And that includes the abstract, the regional metadata, the country metadata, the topical metadata, and the keywords. So starting with the regions, um, regions are an optional association for the content. So not every piece of content in here will be associated with a region. And the region, it's important to know, also has um, a unique connotation at the bank because the regional groups here focus on low and middle income countries. So when something discusses um, East Asia and Pacific, for example, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's talking about Japan. Um, it's not always talking about high income countries, but it is definitely talking about the low and middle income countries that the bank uh, focuses on and where our projects are. So that's um, an important um, kind of aspect of that. There's also the country metadata, which is right here. And this is also optional, but this um, particular set of country metadata will include all countries. So as you can see, um, Japan is included as one of the countries that's discussed. So while regions has a more low and middle income focus, the countries um, are purely geographical, and they will cover and note any country that is talked about substantively in our books, our journals, and our working papers. This is the related topics. And this is a mandatory association. It's based on the World Bank taxonomy. Um, so topics is something that is associated with every single piece of content that you'll find in the e-library. And I want to wrap up with talking about keywords down here and the abstract up here. And these are the types of content that are the most closely tied to the content itself. They're the distilled essence of what this particular book is about, 
what this particular journal article or working paper is about. So while the regions and countries and topics are very useful, it's the abstracts and the keywords and the full text that can really give you power in looking at the database um, itself. I also want to note um, that you'll start to see listings of chapters here, and all of the information that is available for the book is also available for each of the chapters. So that's, uh, that's also a, a great way. Let's take a look at some of the browsers and how they can be used. The, this is an example of a thematic browse. So this is a topical browse on social development. And you'll see um, that it is, um, has additional information here. And it's got several links. Um, and we have these for the topics and the region browse. And these links take you to the topic page at the World Bank. They take you to that open data page that is specifically about this topic. And it takes you to the blog um, that may be about that topic. So this not only gives you access to all of the content in the e-library, but it points you towards useful things that the World Bank is publishing or sharing um, about the, the particular topic or region or country. So this um, and any thematic browse will take you to books, chapters, articles, and working papers that are, that are keyed to that theme. You'll see that there is also a rich set of facets that you can use to further mine um, this set of uh, browsed content on social development. These are organized so that the newest content comes first. So this particular type of browse is a great starting point to see what's new in your area of interest and to see also what other aspects are covered in this area by looking at these facets themselves. So sometimes the keywords are very interesting, um, that kind of thing. So this can be a great way in if this is your area of interest. We want to show another type of browse, and this is the content browse. What I've chosen here is a browse for um, a particular series of books. And this is um, showing you all of the books that are in this series. And one of the main differences between this type of browse and the region, topic, and country browse that we talked about is uh, that this browse is focused at the book level, because it would not make sense to present a browse of a particular series broken out into chapters. So um, where things aren't uh, consistent from place to place, there's often um, a, a logical reason for that. And so what this kind of browse will do is take you to uh, all of the books that are relevant to this. You'll see here that you've got your facets. So this can be a great way in if um, you're interested in a trusted source um, of a, a book or a journal, that kind of thing. Again, this is also um, organized newest content first. So jumping into a book series, jumping into a journal, jumping into a set of working papers can also show you what's new in that area. So that can be a great way in when you've got a, a trusted source or a particular type of content that you're most interested in. Now we'll talk a little bit about the quick and the advanced search. Uh, and I just want to um, say that for some of these slides, we crop them. So what you would see up here is normally the um, quick search bar. So although we're looking at this piece, that set of browses and that, that quick search is available always in the e-library. But we've, we've uh, just done a little shorthand here. So when you use the quick search, the quick search is searching for your terms, and it's a default and, so every term that you put in there will be matched in the content that comes up. And it searches the full text, it searches the authors, the titles, the abstract, the keyword, the series, name, journal name, and much more. So when you start with a, key, with a quick search, it can be a powerful way of starting. Um, the results from a quick search are absolutely equal to having jumped into this advanced search and putting a term in here and using the anywhere. So um, I guess the, the concise way of saying that is whether you or your students start with a quick search or whether you start with the advanced search anywhere, you'll get exactly the same results. So either place is a, is a good way to start. When it comes to the advanced search, and that's what we're looking at here, you'll see that there are um, a number of different ways to use this advanced search. So first of all, um, we have these free text areas where you can um, search for a term anywhere, which is equal to the quick search. Or you can uh, field it to the title, to the author, to the keywords, or to the abstracts. The default here is an and, but uh, you can change that to or or not. And we'll talk a little bit about how to use that. 
So there are a number of free text options here. And there are also um, a whole set of filters that you can use here um, to filter by a type of publication, by a topic, a region, a country. There's a very easy kind of publication date um, filter that doesn't require anyone to type in dates unless they would like to. So this can be very rich. And you can use this free text by itself. You can use the filters by themselves. Or you can combine these for a very strong uh, way to search. And uh, wherever you start, you're going to get faceting and great tools within the search. Um, and we'll show you those as well. So now we're going to look at a couple um, of examples. Uh, and sometimes these examples are simple, and they're meant to illustrate the different results you get in this particular database. So the first example we're going to talk about is um, if you're interested in finding information about a particular country. And the second example we'll talk about is um, if you're interested in finding comparative interest in information about countries. Because these are often the questions um, that we get asked. Uh, people are very interested in this, um, this type of content. So let's say that we're interested in Indonesia. One thing that we could do is go to the region browse, which is right here, and select uh, Indonesia or our country from this country browse. And this is what the results set will look like. Um, you'll see the number of results that you get. Um, you'll see that you've got kind of a wealth of content here. And you'll see that there are additional filters so that you can continue to refine and facet the results that you get. So this is a very targeted way in. Another way in is to put Indonesia in the quick search. And this is the result set that you get. And you can see that it's much larger because it's looking for Indonesia wherever it appears in the full text or anywhere else. So this can be a great way to start, but you almost always want to continue to use the filters here um, or add new free text terms to continue to refine. So this can be um, a, a great way, but it's, it will always require some kind of filtering or faceting to kind of hone where, what you would like. The other example that I want to show is um, searching by using the advanced search and the, the filters. So we talked about this set of filters that we can use. And what we've done here is we've decided that we're going to filter to Indonesia. And in that case, um, what we're going to get is content that is associated with Indonesia. And you can see it's exactly the same set as the set that we got from the country browse of Indonesia. So wherever you start, um, you're going to get the same set of results. And here you can continue to refine. One of the main differences between a browse and a search is that a search is um, you can combine it with full text. And the full text is not available with a browse. So they're both powerful. Um, and you can do different things with them. Um, but there, there are many ways to start. And this one allows you to use um, full text, add full text terms, or, or fielded terms for abstract or keyword, um, and uh, has a set of filters. The next example that we're going to look at is where you want to compare countries. And we're going to show you um, how to use the advanced search. And uh, we're not going to use the free text portion up here for this uh, time. We're going to use the country filter that we use for Indonesia. And here what we've done is we've um, asked to use these three filters, so India, China, and Brazil. And what this means is that the results that we get, which are here, Each one of these res results is China and India and Brazil. So this can be a great way in. Um, you can see that it's a very targeted set of results. And again, you have your um, full text and other search terms that you can add. You have um, notation of the filters that you applied in your search. And you have all of these other um, filters and facets that you can use to continue to refine. And this can be a very powerful, um, a powerful thing. We're going to look at another example. And this is more about finding concepts or, dis or discussions. And the example that we're going to look at is uh, military spending. So one way in is to uh, just throw military spending in the quick search without quotes. And you'll see that it's a fairly large set of search results. And what this is looking for is those two words in the same document, but they're independent of each other. 
So um, it's, it's, uh, you definitely get a lot of results, but they might not be the most meaningful results. You can always use these filters and, and uh, facets and things. But another way to do that is just to use quotes. And when you do that, you can see it's a much more targeted set of results. Um, you can see how we set it up here. Um, this was a quick search that um, just used quotes anywhere. So it's finding those 200 documents where uh, military spending is discussed. Another way in, um, and this goes back to our discussion of keywords and abstracts, um, is that uh, those are the most closely aligned sets of metadata with the content itself. So often a very powerful search can be to look for your term as a keyword or as in the abstract. And when you do that, you know that these five results are the results that specifically discuss military spending. Um, this is also a place where um, you can combine um, an abstract or a keyword term with a full text term. One of the ways to think about it is that um, keywords and abstracts are very good for uh, kind of known concepts. So climate change would be a good thing to search for in a keyword or an abstract that would give you a very good targeted set of results. But you're, if you're looking for projected impact, that might not be something that gets mentioned as a keyword across content or in an abstract. So that would be a good place to combine a projected impact anywhere with um, looking for climate change in an abstract or looking for climate change in a keyword. So these can be very powerful um, kinds of filters. And then I just wanted to show um, that you can apply the filters. And here we've applied um, a health filter and further reduced it. So you really can do quite a bit with, um, with these browses and searches and with all the facets and filters that are available. And one of the last things that I wanted to show you is um, the tools down here. So this is the bottom of a search results page. So we can see the, the kind of the tail end of our facets. Uh, here you can see that if this is an important search to you, and this can be great when you've got complex parameters that you want to put together, you can save the search in your personal account. And what you can do is automatically run that search and any new content that fits your search terms will be included in that. You can also get alerts when things come into the collection that match your search terms. So this can be a great way to keep on top of the things that you need to know. And down here you'll see that there's a search history. So during your session, you can always go back and conduct a search even if you haven't saved it. And here you have access to all of your saved searches as well. So to uh, recap, um, the browsers can be very powerful. So um, if you're interested in that, you can get an alert whenever something new comes in. The quick search can be a very good way to start. Um, you'll have a lot of tools, such as these um, facets and filters, to use with your quick search. And um, with the advanced search, um, it can be very powerful to try and combine um, a filter or a full text word with a keyword or an abstract concept. Um, that can be a very powerful way of focusing and getting to the content that you need. Um, so regardless of um, whether you're working with undergraduates or graduates, um, wherever someone starts in this collection, they'll be able to use filters and facets. They'll be able to kind of turn and refine their, um, their search and browse um, terms. So uh, we hope that that um, can serve a lot of research needs. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass this to Devika. Okay, thanks, Shauna. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that the granular search functionality is just one of the many time-saving tools that eLibrary offers researchers. And you saw things like the chapter level access, that you can save your favorites for fast and easy access later. You can save your search criteria and create alerts based on those. Um, we offer many citation tools that you can um, use during your research. You can email and share your pages and abstracts with con uh, and content with your colleagues. And then the eLibrary does offer unlimited printing, downloading, and use of the content in perpetuity. 
for uh, librarians, eLibrary offers many other features, such as the counter-compliant usage statistics, the MARC records, and metadata are up updated monthly with email alerts, so you can import those into your um, cataloging systems. You can add your institutional logo to the eLibrary homepage. And um, as I mentioned, it's, our content is indexed in um, the major search and discovery services. And we always offer customer support and training upon request. If the institution is not currently subscribed, we do offer free trials available at any time. But one thing to note is that in, uh, subscriptions are only available for institutions at this time. So um, if you are an individual that is not affiliated with an institution that has a subscription, um, the Open Knowledge Repository is an option, which is at openknowledge.worldbank.org. Or you can still access all of the, the working papers in eLibrary because those are freely available to non-subscribers. Um, if you are interested in subscribing, the pricing is based on FTE, or the number of users in your institution, as well as the type of institution, whether you're academic, nonprofit, or corporate. We do offer geographic discounts and consortia discounts. So if you, are, if you belong to a consortia, I would suggest um, contacting your coordinator to see if um, we have an agreement for eLibrary. And if you're a member of Lyricis or um, Skelk or Neural or some of the other major consortia, we, we do have agreements in place. And we're running some specials through the end of May. And you can subscribe directly through us or your preferred subscription agent or uh, any library consortia, as I mentioned, that we work with. So if you have any questions, you can always contact us. These are our emails. Um, you can contact me directly, dlevy at worldbankgroup.org, Shauna if you have questions about the eLibrary platform itself, or customer service is always at online resources at worldbank.org. For those of you who have data questions, and I know that there were many that came through the chat, uh, we would recommend that you contact the Data Help Desk at data at worldbank.org. And we do have time for a couple questions. And let me go to the chat room. We do have a question here asking, what is the difference between the free content online and eLibrary? And that's a good question. Uh, we do have a repository that has our publications online, as well as the World Bank's main website has our content online. But the main difference is going to be in the functionality of the sites. So um, as you saw when Shauna did her demo, that eLibrary offers a lot more granular search functionality, as well as the other research tools, such as um, saving, your individual, uh, saving content in your individual account. You can set up alerts, all the things that I mentioned in this previous slide, which I'll go back to. And also, um, the free options uh, through our repository, the content only goes back as far as the year 2000, whereas the eLibrary contains our full backlist of all of our publications since the 1990s. And we also offer the two World Bank journals that are uh, published through Oxford University Press on behalf of the World Bank. And those are immediately available in the World Bank eLibrary, whereas um, they have an 18-month embargo um, when they go freely available through the repository. So there are some differences um, in terms of the scope and the breadth of the content that's freely available, but the main difference is all the additional functionality and tools that you get with the eLibrary platform. And I'll just take a look and see if we have another question. We have one time for one more. So there's a question about uh, if data is included on the eLibrary site. And I'm going to give that one to Shauna. Thanks. Um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we've done um, as we're building up towards a more robust data integration is be sure to point people towards the relevant uh, open data page when um, you're interested in a region or a topic. So that's kind of our first stop is to make sure that we build robust links in when somebody is looking at something in particular and we can point them exactly where they need to go for World Bank data. 
Um, as kind of a second and third stage, we're looking at a more robust integration, uh, probably of the world development indicators, um, the, one of the data sets that Amanda talked about. So we'll probably be doing some focus groups about that kind of thing, but that is one of the most important things that we want to uh, do in the e-library over the next year. So that's a great question. Thank you. And unfortunately, we're out of time, but for those of you who did ans uh, ask other questions online, we will um, get back to you after the session. And just a reminder that this um, webinar has been recorded and that will be sent out to you shortly. So back to you, Laura. Thank you very much. Well, it looks like we are ready to wrap up. Um, I would like to give a virtual round of applause to our panel for sharing some great information today. And as a reminder, as Davika said, we have recorded today's program. So please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice that will include instructions on how to access the archived version. Thanks again to all of our participants for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session. Enjoy the rest of your day.